Thank you everyone for coming today. Uh, we have Professor Narstedt to talk to us uh, about sensor infrastructure and everything that related to that. So take it away. All right, well, good afternoon. It's my great pleasure to be with you and uh, talk about uh, a research project that I'm really excited about and that is Senselet. Uh, it's um, a sensor infrastructure to improve um, situational awareness in uh, laboratories where you have all kinds of um, equipment and also safety um, in uh, academic and clean room environments. So um, I want to give you first the background, uh, why we are interested in motivation, uh, and then we will be uh, talking briefly about uh, a system and its architecture, the Senselet uh, uh, system. And, um, I will then um, dive into um, some of the challenges that uh, we uh, have in order to create this kind of uh, infrastructures full of sensors that can help uh, various scientific laboratories. So let's get going. So um, in the university, we have a lot of laboratories that have very sophisticated equipment. You can see on this right side, digital microscope. You, this is definitely much, much bigger microscope than probably you have maybe in your class. Um, and you basically put a Petri dish under this microscope and then you sort of uh, put various chemicals and materials and then look through the particular microscope for basically what happens at the nano or micro level uh, inside of the Petri dish. There is uh, also other types of instruments that we have at the university. Um, these are fume hoods uh, where um, you basically will be cooking all kinds of materials. You put together chemicals and then let it bake. And what happens actually is that then they will develop sort of certain chips that you have now in your computer or in your mobile phone. And um, all of these instruments instruments that we currently have at the university that serve material scientists to develop new materials, the, the chemists that develop new chemicals, uh, or new semiconductor uh, fabrication researchers who develop new chips, new devices. All of these instruments are having sensors. And those are sort of little uh, devices that will actually take the measurement out of the environment and then translate it into digital zero ones and then basically transmit it uh, over the network uh, to some other computer that it's going to be stored. So um, what uh, we are currently um, interested in to, and that is currently happening is that many of these instruments uh, are being connected we are digital networks because all of these instruments are microscopes and um, all kinds of other spectrometers are having these little sensors that are uh, sending digital information and we can then store it um, and then we can visualize it. You can then see actually on, on your computer screen what uh, kind of data you are collecting from these various uh, uh, devices. So um, we need real-time data logging around these instruments so that we know that these instruments work properly. The scientific environments that have this kind of uh, instruments uh, like the big microscope, like the big fume hood um, are actually called uh, um, scientific laboratory environments. And one of the examples is clean room uh, where people are actually wearing a white clothes and uh, are coming very cleanly into these uh, uh, in rooms to develop uh, various chips. So um, uh, the, why we need this kind of logging? Um, we need this kind of logging um, of uh, the sensor information because you do want a safer environment, right? I mean, these uh, scientific laboratories uh, will have quite dangerous um, equipment, right, that our researchers work with. Uh, some of these uh, equipment might release uh, some air, right, the hot air, um, or, uh, you know, there might be a water flooding, right, and 
people could slip. So um, we need uh, real-time sort of sensing uh, of many of these scientific laboratories so that we provide safe for research environment um, and therefore there is no more instrument overheating. There is no more flooding or gas leakage, right, that we are currently seeing on these uh, pictures. So um, the other interesting uh, aspect why you need uh, uh, really this monitoring and real-time logging what's happening with these instruments, these scientific instruments, is that um, if you have a bad instrument that is currently overheated or it's not just a safety problem as we had in the previous slide but um, also your experiments can go totally wrongly so for example if you are currently interested in creating some materials that have this kind of uh, or devices that have these very straight lines if you now have a instrument uh, that has some um, overheating uh, uh, failure, uh, you can actually get uh, images about your experiment in this particular shape and you see that your device or your uh, experiment didn't go well because you are not getting straight lines. So um, excess of humidity, excess of temperature can actually lead to uncontrolled uh, and bad experiments which you spend hours preparing for and uh, you don't get the results that you would like. The other thing is that why we need this kind of logging is you do want automatic data logging, right? You uh, don't normally actually, I don't know if you remember, a um, couple of years ago, uh, even in your home, you had a uh, meter that would monitor how much electricity you have um, uh, sort of used, and there would be a person going and writing it down. Now, basically, we have automated monitoring of all of these metering and then sending it somewhere to a utility. Well, the same thing we want to have for these labs. You, if you put a sensor somewhere uh, on this particular equipment, um, like a gas flow sensor, or you have a, some uh, furnace tubes, you basically want to monitor temperature, you don't want somebody to go and write down what's the temperature of this particular uh, sensor or that particular sensor. You want automatically that this particular sensing is uh, being sent to uh, some computer and then the computer collects the data and then shows it to some lab manager. Uh, so you want to actually uh, collect the data in an automated fashion, automatically log and track actually over a period of time, over a week, over a day, over an hour, what is happening in that environment? Because then when you have a good understanding, what's the current temperature um, in, through your sensor, through your thermometer, or what's the airflow, or what's the humidity uh, in your particular lab, you then can think about, oh, my experiment went right, or my experiment didn't go right, and maybe because there was just too much humidity. And therefore the chemical that I put in there reacted with the air and it was just not the right thing to do. So um, automatic logging, tracking of all these environmental data, you get a good understanding of the micro environment around your equipment, and then you can really much better know what's happening. So, um, you know, an example of um, important uh, environmental logging is this chemical fume hood uh, where we basically want to understand when somebody, you know, opens a fume hood uh, and there are all kinds of fumes coming out of that particular uh, device. Uh, did it increase the temperature by how much? Did it increase humidity? Again, uh, to basically cover then are the scientists really safe uh, because it could be a bad fume that is coming out, right? So you want safety, you want the correctness of whatever you are doing currently in the lab. So um, you want to uh, automatically log um, gas flow sensors, temperature uh, sensors to track basically um, various processes that are happening uh, uh, around and in those particular in instruments. So um, 
I uh, try to say what are some of the motivations why we got interested in these uh, various sensors. Uh, um, and we uh, did a good requirement analysis of what these sensors should be doing in terms of monitoring our environment. They should be automatically uh, capturing information about temperature, humidity, airflow, and then collect it uh, somewhere to a computer so that we can have a good understanding what is happening in the, uh, in the laboratory. And so for uh, establishing the sensors and then collection of the data to a particular computer where we then can see and visualize that particular data, you know, rather than go to a therm thermometer and read from the thermometer, we want to see it on the computer. And so for that, we actually developed this uh, sense-led uh, architecture and the system. So the sense-led uh, uh, system uh, currently consists of uh, several components. Uh, one component is the various sensors that we are attaching to the various equipment, if it's microscope, if it is the fume hood. Um, and uh, then these particular in these particular sensors get attached to a small computer uh, that is called Sense Edge in our case, uh, but it's actually a Raspberry Pi. It's a board that basically has a processor, has a memory, and can run programs. And it also has a, connect, trans, uh, so has an antenna, so it can actually receive the data from the sensors, but it also can send the data to a remote computer. So um, we are sensing uh, the information uh, in, around this instrument. And then through the particular sense edge, we uh, collect the data uh, around this particular equipment and then send it wirelessly, Wi-Fi, to a computer that we call Sense Cloud. So sensing is a really, really important aspect of our overall system and a goal. And then uh, uh, when the particular data is uh, here on this particular computer, um, we call it Sense Cloud, we want to analyze that particular data because we want to also see that uh, was some of the sensors faulty or the instrument maybe is now uh, in bad shape and needs attention or if there is a water leakage, then we want to analyze the data and detect if there is a water leakage. And then of course, uh, when we detect and analyze the data, we want to show it actually to the particular researcher uh, that is uh, uh, sitting uh, on at the computer monitor or a lab administrator that is currently monitoring the laboratory. Remember, these equipment in the lab could be multi-million dollar equipment. Microscopes are between one to $10 million. So really understanding that something is happening there is very important. And then of course, if the researchers or the lab administrators detect through the analysis that something happened, then they have to go to the lab. So we are in our sense-led project looking at environment monitoring through the sensors, then collect the data, the digital data through these sense edge small computers, these computers then aggregate the data and then send it over the campus Wi-Fi, which is a wireless network uh, uh, to a computer, which we call sense cloud. The data gets stored there as well as analyzed for some problems, some failures, some anomalies, and then it gets sent to a particular uh, display, either for visualization to the lab administrators or the researchers. So that is the overall architecture. How do you get the data from the labs that monitor the environment around these instruments? How does it get to the user or to the researcher or to the lab manager? Now, I want to talk very briefly about some of the problems that these kind of systems, as you are building them, these infrastructures to help the uh, scientists, uh, what are some of the problems that we are running into? 
So um, um, the challenges currently are very often in this environmental monitoring. Um, and those are some of the problems I want to talk about. So uh, we are having um, various sensors. Some of the sensors are um, uh, commercial. You can buy them. So for example, temperature thermometers, you can buy on the market, on the website and get them. The humidity or the water leakage sensors are uh, all out there that you can do. But the big question currently is, uh, how do you connect them to this particular small computer? Usually the computer that you buy, it's a board and you need to somehow plug it in, right? These sensors. So that then on this particular small computer, called Raspberry Pi, you can then do some processing analysis as well, apply machine learning, apply detection of bad data, right? And send it then to the uh, sense cloud, uh, to a central cloud and then recover from the failure. So these are the functions. And uh, one thing that uh, you do need to consider is, uh, what kind of sensors you are uh, purchasing, how do you connect it to that particular small computer, and where do you place these particular uh, sensors. So this is currently our lab, and um, we are currently putting this particular sensor here or here, basically somewhere sort of under the table, um, and location of these uh, sensors is important, right? Uh, if you put that particular sensor next to your heater, of course the temperature is going to be up, but it doesn't give you the real temperature uh, of the whole room. So you have to be very smart how, where do you place these particular uh, sensors, humidity and so on. So a uh, placement uh, of the hardware in the lithography room, this is one of our clean rooms uh, at the university was an important goal. Uh, the second thing that I mentioned was to integrate these particular sensors to this particular board, right? And uh, we um, uh, sort of did it with this particular uh, hardwire because we did not want to lose any data. Uh, there are sometimes sensors where you can buy them and they will say, yeah, there is some wireless protocol, send the data, but very often you might lose the data when it goes through the air. And so you have to be very careful and be basically we did not want to lose the data, so we hardwired actually the sensors to this particular small computer. Now, this particular wireless uh, network is a very reliable network, a much stronger uh, network, and therefore we didn't lose any data here when it goes to the main cloud or to the computer. So um, um, another sort of problem that we and challenge that we encountered was that um, uh, you know, we started with one sensor and one mini computer, right? This particular board. But we currently, in order for us to understand um, how a um, microscope uh, or a fume hood uh, sort of behaves uh, in, in the room, we had to move to more sensors, right? Um, to understand the east, west, north, south uh, type of side of this, uh, of this environment. So we wanted actually to put more of these sensors to be connected to this particular mini computer called Raspberry Pi. And uh, so we built actually this kind of small single board computers uh, where you can plug in the different uh, sensors and then this particular single computer, uh, mini computer will be sense edge, will be collecting data from multiple uh, sensors that are then or wired to this particular um, board. Um, so um, so that um, uh, was a, sort of really another uh, challenge. And then the next challenge that we are currently facing is really uh, understanding very different types of sensors. We are now really at the boundary of a revolution of many different sensors. You probably might have some sensors where your family members bought some motion sensors that you put in your garage or uh, some sensors that is monitoring how much water is coming out of your water facet and so on. So there is just absolutely boom in number of uh, sensors 
uh, that uh, are humidity sensors, temperature sensors, airflow sensors, door sensors, water rub sensors, oil detection sensors. These are all really good sensors to uh, bring into these scientific laboratories where we have expensive equipment to monitor actually what is happening in this lab. And then we want to actually design this senselet so that um, it gets deployed in a scalable and reliable manner and uh, in a flexible and scientific way. So our current effort is to really build uh, uh, the sensors, uh, aggregate them to that particular board, uh, which is called the Sense Edge, uh, enable multiple um, of these uh, sensors to be added. One thing that you might be also careful if you want to experiment with your own sensors, that there are different types of sensors uh, that have different connectivity capabilities like the uh, I2C or ABC and the high and low um, capabilities. You need to look at the configurations of these sensors and then we need to understand how to actually connect them to these small computers so that they are providing us correct information, correct temperature, correct humidity, correct airflow. So, um, so that's a really big challenge. You know, what kind of sensors you select and are these sensors actually giving you the right information? The second really important challenge is reliability. Do these particular data get correctly up to the computer and your sense cloud, right? From these particular sense edges to the sense cloud. And um, we currently are very much worried about uh, the campus Wi-Fi. I mentioned that this particular wireless um, uh, is strong. It has a lot of bandwidth. It has a lot of bits that can be sent from this mini computer, Raspberry Pi, to the computer, the sense cloud. But sometimes that particular Wi-Fi can go down, right? Or many people use the Wi-Fi, and so you are suddenly sitting, seeing drop of the network bandwidth to that particular cloud. So we need to be very clear uh, what's happening on that particular side. The sensors can fail, right? Um, the sensor uh, stops sending and, and, and sensing proper values. Uh, so you have to take care of that. And also this microcomputer, right? The small computer, uh, Raspberry Pi can actually fail and it's overheated, uh, um, doesn't have energy, right? So, so you need to be really mindful as you build these kind of systems that monitor these scientific laboratories, what is happening. And so we actually, in order to do this kind of high reliability system, we have developed so-called watchdog uh, software that is uh, placed on the sense edges and is watching, is my network fine? Is my sensor fine? And when there are problems, then basically this particular sense edge has the capability to send a uh, alert message to the lab manager, or it can restart itself to basically say, yep, there is currently um, nothing happening and therefore I need to restart myself. So you can first identify the reliability problem by sending heartbeats to the central server. Um, and uh, if you get an acknowledgement, you know that connection is fine. If you don't get acknowledgement, you know there is a problem. And uh, also you can sort of test yourself uh, uh, when you're receiving your ACK, your watchdog software says fine, you pet the dog. Um, but if you don't hear anything, you know something is wrong and you need to react. So in conclusion, uh, I wanted to talk to you about um, uh, a system uh, that um, we are developing here at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign to monitor uh, laboratories that have a scientific instrument for creating new materials, to creating new chips, and uh, to monitor these um, various equipment we wanted to put sensors around this equipment so that, and then get the data and analyze and visualize the data so that then uh, people inside of the laboratory can decide is the equipment working properly. 
at this point, the next big uh, research for us is going to be preventive maintenance of equipment so that when we do detect that there is a problem with the equipment, can we actually start to alert people, bring new parts, do something in terms of maintenance or, and then also we want to do safety. Some of these equipments have chemicals. And so we want to know the location of these particular researchers so that if there is a gas leak, if there is a water leak, uh, uh, we want to know if there is a person and then bring a first responders to help that person. Um, and uh, that for that, we really need to know where these researchers are in these laboratories. So that's uh, basically it. Uh, thank you so much for listening and I am happy to respond to any questions. Great, thank you. Um, I think one great question here would be, what do you think the relevancy of SenseLit and other systems like that uh, is, especially during a pandemic and an increasingly virtual world? So um, the relevance is that um, if you can sense automatically and remotely what is happening in these particular labs, then you can decrease the foot traffic in these particular labs. As I mentioned, if you don't have a good understanding what is happening in these labs, the same way as a utility company doesn't have a good understanding how much electricity you have been using, then some person has to come and read the data. And the same thing happened before SenseLight and before this kind of sensing systems that people, lab managers, had to go into these labs and monitor and write down what is the temperature, what does my thermometer show, what's the temperature in this particular lab. Now it can be automatically, you can actually be at home and have a monitor and see actually what is happening in the lab. So from that perspective, we actually can have many few, fewer people uh, inside of these labs and therefore much less infection probability. Great, um, that's great. Um, I, we had one question submitted here, um, or two actually, so I'll just read it out. Um, thank you for your talk, Professor. You mentioned that a lot of your research uses sensors and Raspberry Pi, which are available affordably. For someone who wants to get involved, do you have any advice on projects they can do at home? That's the first question. So there could be uh, projects uh, that um, uh, one could uh, uh, test uh, uh, different um, um, algorithms uh, if you want to program uh, to look at uh, a detection, for example, of uh, noisy data. So one of the things that when you buy these, in, the, these sensors, um, we always sort of show nice graphs and the, the sensors are behaving beautifully. But um, uh, really putting these sensors into different environments, if you want to do it at home, right? You could put the, the Raspberry Pi and the sensor um, in the kitchen, in the living room. And um, you will see uh, uh, some of the sensor data might be missed. Some of the sensors might be big. Uh, and then it sort of co continues, right? And um, the big challenge currently in the data processing is how do we deal with noisy data? How do we know that it's a noisy data? How do we uh, generate sort of ground truth if you want to do some AI machine learning on that particular data? So, uh, it uh, could be at home that uh, you basically buy, there are sensors that you can either plug in into the, um, into the um, Raspberry Pi. There are also some sensors that will have a Bluetooth, which is uh, a wireless um, uh, protocol between the sensor and the Raspberry Pi. And you can at home start experimenting with, um, um, do I put it in one meter? 10 meter, right? What happens if the sensor is in the kitchen and my Raspberry Pi is in my bedroom, right? 
uh, can the Bluetooth uh, send me good data or does it send me noisy data, right? The reliability in the data. So uh, one uh, needs to then have at this uh, edge device, sounds edge, sense edge, uh, the Raspberry Pi, various software to deal with these failures, uh, anticipating either from the sensor itself or from the protocol network uh, between the sensor and the Raspberry Pi, right? And there are, one can also play with different protocols. Some of the, the sensors, as I said, we actually, for reliability reasons, wired them to the Raspberry Pi, but you could also get sensors that have a, between the sensor and the Raspberry Pi, Zigbee, Bluetooth, UWB, right? There are, different wireless technologies now that are coming that Raspberry Pi and the sensor can talk to each other. So you want to get involved um, more sort of in this advanced level, you would uh, definitely want to test uh, how reliable the challenge that I mentioned, the reliability is very important. The reason actually why reliability is important to study is that um, just for commercial reasons, if the sensors and the Raspberry Pis are not reliable, people will not buy it, right? They, they will not buy it, they will not trust it, and you might also have a problem that you cannot monetize it. Okay, um, and then they asked one more question here. Um, you mentioned uh, that you can go back and analyze patterns in the data. Are there any challenges with maintaining such a large amount of data and storing it? Yes, there is um, uh, a major area of research to, uh, that deals with uh, data management. So when you are dealing with a lot of data, particularly sensory data, you need to very carefully consider what kind of database you will be deploying. Sometimes the sensors being cameras, you might um, you know, deploy uh, databases that will be taking big files, right? Like videos. In our case, we have very small data, humidity, temperature, airflow, very small amount of data. However, they are coming at a very high frequency sometimes two samples per second, sometimes even 30 samples per second. This particular data are called time series data. There's a timestamp and then a value of the, of the sensor. Timestamp and, and value of the sensor and so on. And so you want to have a database that will store the data appropriately, for example, based on the timestamps and then the value of the sensor. So that particular database, for example, we are using is called InfluxDB. But there are other tests, uh, there are other databases. If you have, um, you know, sort of data that are very structured um, uh, to create tables, that's uh, MySQL. If there are big documents that are very unstructured, you might use MongoDB. So looking at the structure and uh, features of your data is really important because you need to decide at the sense cloud or any of the cloud, what kind of database you will be deciding and indexing so that then later on, you can search over that particular database, right? So, we usually, in a time series data, you want to search what happened at that particular time in this particular room, right? And so time is becoming important in this time series data streams. And that's why we selected InfluxDB as a database. And then you also need a good visualizer of these various data, right? Because one thing is you store them in the database but it's not going to be useful if you cannot retrieve the data, query for the data, visualize the data, and uh, manipulate the data. 
And so for that particular visualization, we use a software called Grafana. That is uh, very useful, allows us to connect very easily to the influx DB and uh, retrieve the data, aggregate data, put graphs together and manipulate the large amount of sensor data that we are getting from these scientific labs. Okay, uh, one last question I think we could close off on here would be, um, for a student that might want to be in your position one day doing the research that you're doing, um, what advice would you give them or uh, what software do you think that they should focus on or try to learn or skills they should work on to do that? I think a um, uh, very important aspect is uh, to acquire so-called computational thinking. So in the high school, I think the most important thing is really to acquire mathematics, acquire sort of the, some of the sciences. Because as you can see, we as computer scientists also have to understand some of the other fields, at least at certain level. But, um, and then the, basically maybe a good programming language to acquire, because programming languages start to force you into certain algorithmic thinking. I think that is the, the, the biggest advantage then when you join the computer science, uh, because these algorithms need to then be programmed, either with Python, with Java, with C, C++, depending on where in the software space you are working. And then once you have a good algorithmic computational thinking um, and good programming language, programming uh, skills. So I would not uh, advise, let's start to learn software like you know, Grafana or databases or whatever, uh, because they, by that time you will be next year, it's going to be other databases. This field is moving so fast. I am now on my sixth programming language. Let me put it this way. And uh, I don't know how many software packages uh, I had to sort of go through. So acquiring really the computational thinking, the algorithmic thinking, and then acquiring certain basic knowledge of how to organize software, how to or understand hardware, um, that it basically comes as you go through the computer science uh, uh, curriculum, then um, you will build on top of it, how do networks work? You saw that I talked about that the sensor and the Raspberry Pi or the Raspberry Pi, the Sense Edge with the Sense Cloud talk to wirelessly or wired sort of in the networks. Then you will start to learn what are networks, what the protocols work, um, how does the network communicate with the software and hardware in the computers um, and so on. But I think um, really acquire really good foundation. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Neustadt, to talk for talking to us today. This is really interesting, and I think many students will be able to gain a lot from thank it. Thank you so very thank much you. for the invitation. I really enjoyed this. Thanks.